Thank you, John. Good morning. It's uh, great to see you here this morning. Uh, we will be using PowerPoint, uh, which means all of the scripture pretty much will be on the PowerPoint, so you won't have to be flipping through, but you're certainly welcome to uh, as well. Um, just a couple of quick intro slides, and then before we dive into it, uh, I will stop and, and ask the Lord's blessing again. While we continue to work through the technical, okay. <laughs> So continuing in the series on Proverbs, uh, godly wisdom, and the subject for today is purity of, hand, of heart and hands. Uh, as we were, have already gone through, our brother took us in the first week as an overall introduction on Proverbs, uh, practical wisdom living, that which God gave to Solomon uh, to write down and pass on to his sons which of course is now being passed on to us. Uh, then we talked about the fear of the Lord versus folly of man, pride versus humility, uh, the righteous man versus the foolish man. And now we're moving into perhaps maybe just a little bit, even diving deeper into the practical applications of this wisdom, purity of heart and hands. With that, today we'll start with the purity of heart with these three areas in particular, uh, being full of truth or truthful, uh, full of faith or faithful, uh, and full of integrity. And unfortunately, integra full is not a word. Uh, so really the best way to say full of integrity would be upright or uh, virtuous. Um, the approach as we talk about the purity of heart is to define each of these things, to look at them from the aspect of God's character. So when we think about uh, all of the truths that would come out of Proverbs, really in all of the truths that would come out of the word of God, uh, that we ought to be applying to our own lives, uh, this is not just something that is out there separate from who God is, like he's suddenly demanded or commanded us to start behaving in a certain way. But every single one of these truths really is the application of who God is. And we'll see that in each one of these. So the definition that this is a reflection of God's character, we're going to look at some of the verses in Proverbs that gives us uh, that practical wisdom aspect coming from Proverbs, some New Testament teaching, and then our application, uh, or I shall say, our challenge to our own hearts in these things. So let's again just pause and ask the Lord uh, to lead our time together. Our Father, we are eternally grateful for your Son, the Lord Jesus, and we are eternally grateful for the Spirit of God that you have given to and dwelt each one of your children, all those who have received the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful uh, that the work that is being done in us is not dependent on our own strength and flesh, but it is dependent on the Spirit of God. Father, we're thankful that even now as we open up your word, the, the application of your word uh, the wisdom of your word is not dependent on the one that is communicating it, but it is dependent on the Spirit of God. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you and pray that you would, as our brother prayed earlier, that you would speak mightily by your word this morning to each one of us. We pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So, the first one uh, being truth. Uh, and for a definition of truth, Really, the thing I kept coming back to is what Pilate himself said to the Lord Jesus and said, what is truth? What is truth? Um, it's hard to define truth. Truth is absolute perfection. It is, and it is the very core of who God is, which we'll look at in just a minute. So I just took this little graphic of the, the Hebrew word, I think it was, that I used the Hebrew word that was used for truth in Proverbs. 
uh, to show some of the different ways that it is uh, translated um, and used uh, throughout scripture. But really truth is the absolute certainty, steadfastness, committed, the thing that is absolutely without doubt, without casting of any sort of shadow against it. As we think about God is truth, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4, uh, it's written, he is the rock, a God of truth. And keep in mind, as Deuteronomy is being written and as the children of Israel are going through their experiences, uh, they are dealing with lots of other gods around them. You think of Joshua later when they said, consider who you might serve, God or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So they're dealing with all of these other gods. But this God, he is a rock and a God of truth. In Numbers 23 and verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? The absolute certainty that God is who he said he is and will do as he says he will do. Which is also, by this verse, if I can just point out the very practical understanding to our hearts this morning, the natural man is the exact opposite of that. Apart from Christ and the work of God through the Spirit of God, we naturally would be liars. Just like the serpent in the garden to Eve. And that's what he said, God is not man that he should lie. That statement by itself just communicates the very reality that man in our natural state would be a liar. Psalm 31 verse 5, O Lord God of truth. We're going to go through these quickly, so I'm not going to read every single one of the words. And of course, John 14, 6, as we know, the Lord Jesus said of himself, I am the truth. Uh, as we considered this morning in thinking about the glory of God and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my glory, as was uh, read this morning in Isaiah, uh, I will not share with another. And then the Lord Jesus himself prayed in John chapter 17, says, give me the glory that I had with thee before the world was. It was not shared with another. It's because he himself is God. That therefore, he, has the, he is the truth. He is the glory. It was his glory to have. It was not shared with him. It is his glory, and he is the truth. So God is true, and he is the truth. It's his character, and this is why the wisdom is being given to us to apply truth, to walk in truth, as, a, as it were. Uh, just some verses from Proverbs on the subject. For my mouth will speak truth. This is what Solomon would be saying, that we would speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. In verse 12 and 17, chapter 12 and verse 17, he who speaks truth declares righteousness. The truthful lip, in verse 19, shall be established forever. Uh, have you ever noticed that a lie oftentimes needs to get changed? over time. It doesn't stay consistent and steadfast because as soon as you're found out in a lie, you create another lie. And it will be proven false, but the truth will stand forever. Cannot be proven to be false. Will not create another opportunity for lying because the truth is the truth. Verse 22 of the same chapter, those who deal truthfully are his delight. Verse 14 and, uh, 14 and verse 25, a true witness delivers souls. Think about that from the context of the gospel. A true witness delivers souls. Ezekiel chapter 33, the watchtower, the one who does not give the warning to the people of the enemy coming in while the blood is on their hands. 
But if you warn the people and you tell them of the danger, the blood is on their own hands. He who speaks truth, he who speaks the truth of the gospel, will deliver souls. Proverbs on untruth, uh, just to try to stay with that sort of logic. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. An evildoer gives heed to false lips. Uh, do, <laughs> we see that in the world that we live in, don't we? Like all around us, lying all the time. All the time. He who has a deceitful heart finds no good. And this really takes you beyond just the speaking of truth, but the reality of what's in your heart. Is your heart aligned with God and with his truth? The false witness in verse 9 of 19 uh, will not go unpunished. He who speaks lies shall perish. Verse uh, 25, 18, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, or excuse me, yeah, a sword and a sharp arrow. It's like being banged on the side of the head. I'm sure you've had that experience. Somebody being a false witness against you, lying about you or to you, and that's what it feels like. And this is to your neighbor, somebody that you're presumably close to. And lastly, uh, Proverbs 26, like a madman is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Sarcasm, which could be lying. And then you cover it, I'm just joking. You can take a joke, can't you? Well, no, some of us are thin-skinned. We can't always take jokes. What does the New Testament teach us? Walking in truth, for I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. And as John would continue there, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And again, this is not just walking like, okay, I know this to be true, therefore I'm doing it, but rather walking in the light of the truth of who God is, walking in the character of God. Ephesians 4 and verse 25, very practically now saying, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. This is the great chapter, at least I'll describe it that way, the great chapter of talking about the, the purpose and uh, benefit and blessing of the body of Christ coming together. There is one faith, one Lord, one God, one baptism, but you all have been brought together in one body for the edification of the body. So put away lying lips and speak truth to one another. For we are members of one another. Ephesians chapter 5, similar to my thought from uh, Third John, uh, you are the light of the Lord. Walk as the children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is truth. Now, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, you're not going to see truth mentioned as the fruit of the Spirit, but here in Ephesians chapter 5, you see that. The light of the Lord, walk in the light of him, and the light will expose that which is darkness. And let's be clear, it's not our responsibility. You may have heard me say this before. It is not our responsibility to shine the light. We are the light. We are to walk in the light. We are to walk in truth. And as we do that, the light will expose the darkness. So the challenge to the heart. Uh, my first question to challenge your own heart and my heart. Do you value truth over lies? I sound like a politician right about now. Do you value truth over lies? Is it more important to you to speak truth? Or the second question is, is your first tendency to tell the truth or lie for self-preservation. Well, I'm, I'm nervous about what they're gonna think about me. 
I'm nervous about what that experience will be if I, so I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna tell a little white lie, they say, for self-preservation. We were talking in our um, home group a couple of weeks ago after the message on pride and just the realization that sometimes we find it easier to confess our sin to God than we do to other people. We'd rather lie to other people because of what they might think, but we find the grace of God being more sufficient for us so we can, we can confess to him, but we won't tell you. We should be nervous about confessing our sin to God, like the crushing blow of a loving father because he desires to discipline us. So do we value truth over lies? Is our first tendency to tell the truth or is it to lie for self-preservation? Are you willing to speak truth in love even when it might be difficult? That might be in the context of yourself, your own life and experience, your own sin or something that needs to be confessed, that you need to speak truth. Somebody asks you a question, how are things going? What sort of sin struggles do you have right now? Are you willing to speak truth and, and tell them? Are you willing to speak truth to somebody else when something needs to be said to them? Moving on to faithful. Uh, describes a person or thing as characterized by trustworthiness or belief. So God is faithful. Deuteronomy 7, 9. He is God, the faithful God. Uh, again, earlier, Deuteronomy 32, the God of truth. Here he is the faithful God. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 25, he who calls you is faithful, steadfast, consistent. This is singularly, all right, uh, dually, <laughs> The two things, you guys have been hearing me say this for the last six months probably in particular, the two most wonderful, perfect characteristics of who God is, his goodness and his faithfulness. Those are the two rocks of who God is that, that brings us into a sal salvation, into a saving relationship, eternal relationship with himself. He is faithful. Has God not said and he will do it? Absolutely. Romans chapter 3, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. His faithfulness is dependent on himself. It's not dependent on us or our response, our actions, or any of those things. God is faithful. So this is a characteristic that should be bearing out in our lives as a result of the character of God transforming us by the Spirit of God. Proverbs on faithful. A friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. Uh, I think we like to do that here. We like to call each other family or brothers and sisters. And why do we do that? Because we're born for adversity. Now, sometimes that adversity means adversity, right? Maybe not for you guys. Maybe that's just all centered around me. But it also means when there is, why are so many of you smiling at that statement? I don't understand. But the brother born for adversity means when difficult times come, they're going to be faithful. We're going to walk through it with you. Uh, this next verse, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Do you have a friend that will speak truth to you? That sometimes it hurts, but it's exactly what you need. I've got several that are like that. I've got one in particular uh, who shares my bed with me. And there are often times I'm telling her that I really don't like her or appreciate her very much. After I say that, I say, of course, I'm joking, so I guess I'm lying. <laughs> oh, I confess to you, Lord, that I lied. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And as brothers and sisters, we need to get to that place where we can speak truth in love to demonstrate the faithfulness 
of coming alongside, of being a brother or a sister born for adversity. There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, verse 18, 24, who can find a faithful man. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who will find a faithful friend to walk through this with you? Mercy and truth preserve the king and loving kindness he upholds his throne. A faithful man will abound with blessings. Very, very different than the world would teach. The world would teach, get what is right for you. Take care of number one. But a faithful man or woman will abound with many blessings given by God. For New Testament teaching, be a faithful steward. All that we have is God's, and it's our responsibility to be a steward of what he's given us and to be faithful with it. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, in the fruit of the Spirit, one of those things that should be bearing out in us is faithfulness. Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful in what he and what is least will also be faithful in much. Even in the little things, we need to be faithful with it. Not just the big things, waiting for some big opportunity, but be faithful with the little things to prove out that you will be faithful in the big things. Many people in the New Testament, these are probably just several, there, I'm sure there's more, but that they are referred to as faithful. Would you not? I mean, I just said, dually, faithfulness is one of those things about God that is like one of the two, in my opinion, best characteristics of who God is. He's faithful. And if that's true, would it not be terrific for you to have the testimony from somebody else to say that person is faithful? So when you look at these examples in the New Testament of these individuals that are described as faithful. You have Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Paul referred to himself as faithful. He said, God counted me faithful. And Timothy, he's referred by Paul as sending, uh, as Paul was sending him to Corinth as being faithful. And met in several other places, you see that of Timothy's character. Uh, and then these last three, Tychicus, if I'm saying that correctly, Epaphras and Onesimus, uh, they're not mentioned very often in the New Testament, five times, three times, and two times. But the characteristic of being faithful is one of the things that's mentioned. Perhaps that would be the only thing we would want to be remembered by, being faithful. Second Timothy 2.13, I bring this out really just as a reminder that God's character doesn't change. He remains faithful even when we are faithless, he cannot deny himself. And the reason that that's important for us to remember is that we're not talking, when we talk about faithful, we're not talking about perfection. Because even when we are faithless, when we do go through, through those times when we're not going to be perfect, that God himself is still faithful. So the challenge is to the heart. Are you faithful with the truth? The gospel. Are you faithful to look around at the people in your life, whether it's other family members, neighbors, people that you work with, and presenting the truth? And I'm not suggesting that we all need to be evangelists or that we're going to be gifted in that way, but is your life lived in such a way that they would be able to see the truth? And will you be faithful in responding to that? with the gospel, the truth of God's word? Are you faithful in your relationships? Husbands and wives, parents and children, as brothers and sisters in Christ, are we being faithful one to another? Are we being faithful to God and our relationship with him? Are we steadfast? Would somebody consider us to be faithful, loyal, steadfast, committed? Are you faithful with your wealth? The things that God has given you, are you going to use those according to what he would want you to do? Or have you decided that all that I have is mine? 
thanks be to God that I have this, it's mine. Or thanks be to God that you've given me this to use for your glory, for your purposes. Integrity, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness or moral excellence, the state of being whole and undivided. Upright or virtuous is one of some of the words that we would see in scripture. God is upright. He is uh, full of integrity, virtuous. He is the rock, again, Deuteronomy 32. Upright is he. Good and upright is the Lord, Psalm 25 and verse 8. Psalm 92 and verse 15, to declare the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And really this whole idea of integrity pulls together both the honesty, the truthfulness, and the faithfulness. It like is the all-encompassing thing of are you actually who you are? purport yourself to be? Are you the same wherever you go? And we'll come back to that in a little bit in the challenge section. But that's who God is. God does not change. I, the Lord God, do not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. The very character of God and his truthfulness, his faithfulness, he is upright. He does not change. Proverbs on integrity or being upright. Uh, he stores up uh, for us, the wisdom for us. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He walks with integrity, walks securely. Uh, you don't have to be nervous about anybody finding you out if you're walking in integrity. You walk securely because... You are who you say you are. If you're not who you say you are, then you're going to be a little nervous that you'll be found out. A dishonest scales are an abomination of the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. I mean, this is so like we don't do that these days, right? Like we don't weigh things out, but it's the same idea that you're not trying to cheat anybody, that you're being truthful faithful, that this is what it is. We had a situation uh, at camp just over the last several months. We had a portion of land uh, that we had uh, purchased a number of years ago, but left the timber rights over to the original owner of that land. And recently he came and he said, okay, I want to take the timber. It's my timber. I want to take it. Well, we did a survey because we wanted to make sure that everything was aligned, that everything was good. Well, it turned out that the survey gave him more land than he thought he was gonna get. Not a lot, but when he went out to try to survey the land, he had laid it out and almost everything was good, but this one line was not perfectly right. Our survey said, oh, you actually, it's over here. You get more land. What a testimony that is. You're weighing it out. You're being truthful and honest. Could there have been the tendency, well, we don't really need to tell him that, do we? Like, we could keep that for ourselves. He doesn't, he thinks the line's here. Let's just do that. No. Integrity. So that you can walk securely and not be found out later. I won't keep going through the rest of these. Well, the righteous man walks in his integrity. The Lord tests the hearts. Remember that this is not just how you are appearing on the outside, but it is the very matter of what is going on in the heart. So the, the purity of the heart as we're talking about. Add to your faith virtue. So when we talk about New Testament on this integrity, the first thing that you see is here in verse three, his divine power, the spirit of God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Him who called us by glory and virtue, moral excellence, integrity. He has called us out of his glory and his moral excellence to do this. And We've been made partakers of his divine nature. So not only has he called us out to do these things, but he has actually equipped us by giving us the spirit of God, the divine nature 
to be able to do these things. And then in verse five, he says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, the belief in God for who he is and the power that he's enabled you with, add to that virtue, moral excellence, that our life would represent that which he has not only called us out to, but that he has by his divine power given us the ability to do. The challenges to the heart, is your life characterized as being one of integrity, uprightness? Are there things that when you are, the second question, I'll just dive into that one. Are you the same person in all of your circumstances or do the people you are around define how you are acting? Are you the same in the workplace as you are when you come to chapel? Are you the same in chapel as you are when you go to camp? Are you the same when you're with your family as you are when you're with others? Are you the same when you're by yourself versus when anybody else is around? I think of children. Oftentimes they... Uh, struggle being truthful and faithful and living a life of integrity. And I'm not ridiculing children because we are literally no different. You can just see it so plainly with children when they get into a fight. Not that any of the children in this chapel ever do that. Um, they get into an argument. They only tell their side of the story. Well, Susie hit me. Well, that's true. But what did you do to Susie? Nothing. And Susie's saying, well, Johnny, call me bad names. Johnny, did you call Susie bad names? Maybe. Will we be truthful? Will we speak true? And will we be the same people that we purport ourselves to be everywhere we go? Three Proverbs where it basically tells us it is better to be poor than align with these three things. So better to be poor than a liar, Proverbs 19 and verse 22. It's better to be poor and faithful. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. It's better to be poor than perverse in his ways. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he were rich. And this is a challenge for all of us, I think, on this side of eternity. If we sit there and think about our eternal relationship with God, we can think all day long we would gladly give up our riches. But the very practical living out of our lives, we don't want to be poor and we would be willing to sacrifice some things to be poor. But the proverb says it is better to be poor than a liar. It's better to be poor and faithful. And it's better to be poor than to, to walk perversely in his ways. Okay, lastly, purity of hand. So the started with this, the purity of heart and hand to deal with this first, we had to, and believe me, this is short, I promise you, if you're getting nervous, uh, you start with the heart aspect of this truthfulness, of the faithfulness and of the integrity. And now how is that going to play out very practically in your life? So the warnings against seducing sin, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The mouth of an immoral woman is a deep pit, but who is abhorred by the Lord will fall there. A harlot is a deep pit and a seductress is a narrow well, increases the unfaithful among men. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring in a polluted well. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. Proverbs is full of warnings of the temptations of sin. It's not just telling you how to do these things or that we need to be these things, but it's also warning you of what is out there that will affect you. So the challenge is to the heart when it comes to the seduction of sin. 
do you recognize how sin and the wicked one attract you? Are you aware that this happens and it will feed toward your flesh rather than toward your spirit? Do you recognize those things in your life? Are you faithfully walking with integrity in truth? Because this is how you take those three things and bring it out into the practical application of our living. Are you faithfully walking with integrity in truth? Are you willing to build accountability with others in order to flee sin? To be willing to have real conversations about real temptations, real struggles that you might be having in order for you to walk faithfully with integrity in truth. And here's the last slide. As you can see in the picture depicted here, the heart is being held by these hands, the guarding of the heart in order to guide the hand. My brothers and sisters, we cannot do this on our own. This is not something that we can accomplish in the, the strength of our own flesh. We need the divine power given to us by the, by the living God <clears throat> in the person of the Spirit of God. But I would also declare that we also need each other. We cannot do this on our own. This is where we come alongside and faithfully encourage and build one another up. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for uh, this truth uh, from your word, and we do pray uh, that you would encourage, convict, challenge, and conform us. We pray all this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.